Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we have a tier list for the faction unique units that will be found in Total War Three Kingdoms. Now the tier list here is designed for everything in the main game and every DLC except for the eight princes, because the eight princes units are just not interactive with the rest of these units, so I kept them out. In the future, we might do a separate one for the eight princes unique units. But for now, I just have the 48 unique units that's available throughout the Mandate of Heaven, the Rise of the Warlord, and a World Betrayed Time Starts. So with the format, what we're going to do here today is we're going to first introduce the rules for this tier list, and then we're going to go into a preview mode, looking at each of the unit cards in game. Just as a little reminder to what the unit does, I'll give you a brief spiel of my opinion on the unit. Then we'll come back in for the tier list, we'll rank a few of them, and we'll jump back and forth until we rank all of them. And we're going to divide them up by time. As you can see, I already have the units listed with the Mandate of Heaven units first, and then Rise of Warlord, before we wrap up with some of the World Betrayed and also the Bandit rework units. So first, we need to make some ground rules. The opinions here are my alone, so you're going to have different opinions on the tier list. And my experience for the tier list will be based entirely on campaign mode, uh, namely single player campaign on legendary difficulty, as that's where I have most experience with these units. Now, obviously, you might have different opinions of these units, whether in your gameplay, you might use a different playstyle than I do, or you might be playing multiplayer a lot and you have a different opinion of the units in that mode. And everything will be based on romance mode as well, since that's where I have the most experience playing as well. So that's kind of our ground rules. So with the ground rules set, let's first cut into our preview of the Mandate of Heaven units, and we'll come back and rank those. Alrighty guys, so before we jump into ranking our Mandate of Heaven units, well, let's take a look at all of them. They are exactly 10 unique faction units from Mandate of Heaven that was added in for Liu Chong's faction, Lu Zhi's faction, Zhang Ziao's faction, Zhang Liang's faction, and Zhang Bao's faction. And we have all of them lined up here to take a quick look at their stats and just review what they're designed for before we rank them back on our tier list. So first up, we have Chen Royal Guards here. These are just iconic units. Now they did have to survive through a series of nerfs especially to their range. So they're now 200 range units, and they do the same amount of damage as a regular crossbow units. So it's the same attack rate, same base damage, and same armor piercing damage as a basic crossbow unit. You get slightly higher ammo than a crossbow unit, but what really makes them stand out is their access to the formation of mixed missile, which allows them to form up a front line of infantry, as we can see here that will hold enemy cavalry at bay while the units behind can still shoot at the enemy. So they're very self-sufficient and on top of that they have very high armor stat. So 53% armor is extremely high and you get additional armor from the shield. You also get additional range block chance from the shield. So overall just a very good defensive range unit uh, with decent attack as a crossbow unit. Uh, also, decent morale. Uh, we're, let's see, decent morale and decent hit points. It's not very high. And in melee, they're pretty good. 2730, it's pretty close to what you would have in a spear guard unit, uh, which they kind of remind you of once they go into mixed missile or if we go to melee. Uh, they don't put away their crossbow, so you can't really tell. But you can see it's a short spear with a nice shield. So that's kind of their setup here. And moving on, uh, and by the way, these are all recruitable at rank 3. So the setup is always a rank 3 unit and a rank 6 unit. So our rank 6 unit here is our Chen Peacekeepers. Now these are excellent cavalry unit, they're melee cav units. So their default weapon is the sword and shield. They have 155 charge, 68 morale, okay amount of hit points for cavalry, that's pretty standard. They're not very fast because they also have extremely high armor. So they share the same armor as the Chen Royal Guards we just saw at 53%. They have higher melee evasion and they have a better quality shield. So you get a better armor from shield on top of that as well as a better shield evasion. And there's also 80% range block chance. The base amount is 60, but since we have Liu Chong as the leader, 
there's a 20% boost from the commander skill tree. We can kind of ignore that. Whether 60 or 80, if you add on the 50% missile resistant that was added for all melee cavalry in patch 1.5, they are going to be very tanky against range. And they can shoot back at range as well, given that they also have the exact same crossbow as the Chen Royal Guards. 6 attack rate, 18 base damage, 46 range armor piercing damage, same amount of ammo, same amount of range. So they're just Chen Royal Guards on horseback with better shield that has added charge, better morale, and slightly less health simply because you have 30 units versus 120 units. So when you're considering the amount of range damage output, you have one fourth the amount of unit as a standard infantry stack. So you're gonna be doing less in terms of range damage, but after you finish shooting your arrows, you're still a cavalry with decent charge. Very good at harassing the back line of the enemy because they're so tanky that archer is just not gonna bring them down and they can easily wipe them out and then use their range to harass enemy infantry. So definitely a great unit in the game. And we can move on to our next faction, Lu Zhi. So Lu Zhi here has two unique units also available in rank three and rank six for all their uh, champions or all their commanders of various classes. And here we have the Defenders of the Empire. So this, as the unit card says, is a frontline unit that's good at missile defense, and most importantly, they are unbreakable. So these guys are pretty much the spear guard replacement for this faction. They outperform the spear guard uh, in many aspects. So similar damage profile, but unbreakable. Similar range block chance, but higher armor. So these are your, you know, steady frontline. Ludra has the best frontline unit in the game, in my opinion. These guys are what you want in the front. Uh, there's simply nothing that can beat them in that aspect. You have access to the standard shield wall. It takes them a little while to form up, but it looks pretty nice. You have a very big shield. Once again, with a short spear, one-handed spear, you have access to turtle, which gives you uh, additional 100% range block chance, which just makes you, you know, invincible to range. And then you also have circle as a formation. Now this one's probably the prettiest uh, with the way they line up. So that's the unit here, Defender of the Empire. And moving on at rank six, we have access to their unique cavalry unit. And this one's called the Destroyers of Treachery. They have uh, a good charge and splash damage. So splash damage is what sets them apart. So you see they have a pretty decent charge for a Vanguard unit, for a shock cavalry unit. Uh, the standard health for 30 units of cavalry, 50k. The morale is a little bit low, uh, but that can depend heavily on your uh, generals leading the army because it's kind of based on authority stat, but the base amount of morale is quite low. Uh, damage wise, very heavily skewed to armor piercing damage, which is excellent because that's what you want if you can choose between the two distributions. Uh, you'll go through the enemy armor as the name suggests and with splash damage you can do a lot more damage to enemy units now the thing with most shock cavalry is you are not dependent on your melee attack to wipe out units most of the damage is determined by the initial charge the charge bonus itself will wipe out most units so there's kind of debate of whether you even need the splash damage but perhaps it's pretty good if you have a giant clump of enemies stuck on your front line. You can charge in from behind. You might not wipe out multiple units at the same time, but if they get stuck in a fight, they can wipe out large masses of unit through their splash damage attack. And we have to notice here, they are also wearing really, really tough armor. 53% armor is probably the top tier armor you'll see on units in the game. And because of this heavy armor they're wearing, they lose out a lot of speed. So they're one of the slowest shock cavalries in the game. And given the fact that shock cavalries take more damage from range now, they're very vulnerable to enemy range damage. But overall, if you can keep them safe from enemy range and charge them in as sort of the hammer to your hammer envoy tactic, you can wipe out enemy infantries quite fast. So this is the destroyers of the treachery. Moving on, we are with yellow turban units. Now the previous three yellow turban generals, uh, Gong Du, Huang Shao, He Yi, do not have any unique units. They're basically given access to a deeper reform. Uh, all three units are shared, like Guardian of the Land, Yu Xia, and Archery Masters. You can get them for any faction, so I don't consider them unique units. They're just basically units you start out early with, similar how Liu Hong can start out with the Imperial Army, but every faction can recruit those. 
but the three yellow turban brothers that were introduced in Mandy of Heaven do in fact have unique units that are also structured as rank 3 and rank 6 units that's available for all classes of the yellow turban, which is quite useful because yellow turban classes are a little bit confusing and uh, let's take a look at some of these units. So first up we have Messengers of Heaven. Now these guys are not very organized. I think the game has an issue with the large size of these uh, cavalry units. So cavalry units on well large graphic setting is 30 units. This is a larger size retinue because there's different sizes within yellow turban units and this one has double the size of a standard unit. So you have 60 units and their spacing seems to be messed up with the you know it's not very neat and you can't get it very neat which is interesting because you know i can get it into a formation no problem but if we come out of formation it just looks like they're you know not spaced correctly um, maybe they can look into that but overall uh, speaking of the unit itself it's interesting how you get this unit at rank three uh, because it's quite strong ridiculously high morale 75 is very very high it's a melee cav, so you get the 50% missile resistant, you get a decent amount of range block chance. They're not wearing much armor, which you might think is a bad thing, but if you look at speed, low armor means high speed. So this is excellent for kiting units. Most generals start out around 95 speed unless they have mobility. So this allows you to chase down generals. You also have a lot more health, uh, usually 50k for cavalry but you have 76k because you have extra men in your group. Now, the problem with this ratio here, as you notice, 50k to 76k is per unit health is lower, right? Because you have 30 men for 50k, now you have 60 men for 76k. The problem here becomes each individual unit health becomes lower, so as they do damage to you and you sustain damage, you're gonna lose models much faster. Whereas you might have an injured model from a standard 30 men cavalry and they don't go down you can still use them to fight they're just injured here they might die off a little bit faster per unit so that's a trade-off here but very high morale you can't complain about that and high speed due to low armor is pretty decent their damage profile is okay 32 30 uh, the attack rate's a little bit low and since they're a melee cav the charge damage isn't as high so you obviously just want to utilize the low speed to harass enemy backline uh, range units who won't be fighting back at you. Uh, you have a you know pretty tanky stat against them with the missile resistant and a decent amount of range block chance. You're not going to get the extra 20% from the skill trees because you're yellow turbans and you don't have that nobility skill. Uh, moving on, at rank 6, John Zealous Faction will gain access to Chosen of the Eight Immortals. Now these units are very unique in that they are a small size infantry unit, so you have half the standard size. Instead of 120, you get 60 and you end up losing a bit of health for that. You go down to 54k. But the trade-off here, like we mentioned, opposite of the Messenger of Heaven, is that per unit health is actually goes up. Because if you look at this unit, 72 for 120, half of that, but our health doesn't go down by half. So per unit health is actually higher. So each of these guys are actually tankier. You have good morale, you have very good charge for infantry unit, 138, right? This cavalry, 164, this infantry, 138. So impressive there. Uh, you have very high melee evasion, so you'd be dodging most of the attack instead of actually tanking them because you have low armor, which gives you decent speed. Infantry speed varies from low 30s with heavy armor, 30, to you know your speed being 43 because you're wearing very light armor. Uh, the problem here is you have no range block chance. That's a big weakness for infantry units. You do have access to smoke screens, which can help you close gaps, and it probably thrive a little bit better if you're in ambush battles, or if you have a way, like say, use these messenger of heaven to mess up the enemy backline so their archers can't shoot at you. That definitely synergizes very well. But up close, they are very deadly. You have 40 attack rate, which is very, very fast for infantry unit and you have a good amount of armor piercing as well as base damage. So these guys hurt uh, combined with their uh, charge bonus and fast speed. You can use them to charge into enemy melee lines and wipe them out very quickly as long as you don't get taken out by enemy ranged units. So that's all of Zhang Ziao's units. Uh, moving on to his brothers, we'll start with Zhang Liang. So Zhang Liang's playstyle is a defensive playstyle, just as a reminder. Uh, he contributes zeal through defense. And here we have Gallants of the People, and indeed it's a defensive frontline unit. 
And these guys have a very little shield, but it still gives them 55% range block chance. It doesn't give them as much of armor from the shield. But because it's nimble and small, you get a decent amount of shield melee evasion on top of that. And they have good armor, which is rare for yellow turban units. And because of the high armor, they're a little bit slower. Charge is pretty standard for uh, infantry unit. And the spear they're carrying looks like the same spear as uh, spear guards. And they're actually a pretty good comp to spear guards, except for they have pretty high morale. So it's basically the yellow turban version of the spear guard with good morale and overall uh, formations. You're missing the turtle formation. I think it's because of the shield size, but you do have access to a uh, shield wall here, which is still uh, very useful to get your charge reflect, extra melee evasion, extra range block chance up. So you go up to about 70% range block chance, which is great for a frontline unit, uh, especially for the yellow turbans. Now yellow turbans do have access to stored shield, which is this 80% range block chance giant shield infantry unit, and that's very good. But that unit doesn't have as much uh, morale as this unit, so that's what makes this unit uh, special. And once again, these are recruitable at rank 3. And moving on, we have the Tyrant Slayers. Now these guys are pretty fun to use. They have this special passive ability. This is when passive abilities started coming into the game for regular units. You have Slayers of Heroes. It's a passive buff. As long as they're in combat with enemy general, they gain 300 additional uh, percent of melee base damage and melee uh, armor piercing damage so you're going to be multiplying these damage by four when you're fighting generals which is actually very high because these damage number although you know generals can hit for like 1k of armor piercing damage but that's only one model right we have 30 units here each hitting for 30 or you have 30 units here each hitting for 120 once you get that buff on a general you also have very high charge for a uh, shot cavalry and uh, you have decent speed. So this is probably the same speed as most generals are in the game. So you'll be able to uh, pin them down if you want. Once you get into melee range with them, they probably can't outrun you. And you have decent amount of armor, which, you know, it's a trade-off with speed. Uh, you have good melee evasion, which should help you against enemy generals. And the damage is, it's okay. You're mainly going to rely on this multiplier. They're a very specialized unit for that purpose. Uh, but you can definitely still use them as, you know, a charging uh, hammer for your hammer envoy or just charging into the back line assuming they can be protected from enemy range units and then moving on we have Zhang Bao, the last of the Zhang brothers his role is the offensive role you're trying to do casualty damage with him to gain zeal and his unit the rank 3 version is the zealots of the way this is a Glaive unit. This is what I would call the Pearl Dragon clone for the Yellow Turbans. Uh, it also has a passive ability, but if you just look at the stats real quick, you have okay morale. It's not very high. You have okay uh, melee charge. Um, actually, more than okay. You know, for a melee infantry unit, having this amount of charge is not bad. The attack is okay. The evasion is quite high, and the armor is quite low. Good speed because of the low armor, and you have range block chance magically even though you don't have shield because you're these nimble uh, warriors that can dodge arrows and dodge attacks that's kind of their theme similar to pearl dragons in the game they even shared a similar weapon now their skill is called focused on combat it's kind of like the sentinel skill the longer you are in combat the higher phase you go up and the more bonus you get and the trade-off here is more melee evasion or less armor so at the end, after stacking this for about, let's say, 34 seconds, so you need to be in combat, sustained combat for 34 seconds, you'll reach phase 5. And at this phase, you'll be at 88% melee evasion, but 0% armor, essentially. So whatever hit you take will be true damage, but you will dodge 88% of your hits. Uh, the actual number is probably a little bit lower than 88 because I know the game is designed where even if you have 100% melee evasion, there's still a very low hit chance, like 4% default. So around 80% dodge. Uh, it's very high, so it makes them very good at holding trokes. But this is not the setup I prefer. I'd rather have a tankier, consistent, you know, high armor front line with shield that can sustain against enemy range. Here. I feel like the use of this unit is if you have a place that you need to hold 
for a sustained amount of time and you know the enemy range can't hit you, then situationally these guys are good, right? They don't hit very hard, but they just stall for a long time against enemy melee, but they're very vulnerable to range. Uh, 35%, you know, you think is great because they don't have shield, but 35% is not that high. You know, you can use your archers to shred sh uh, spear guards at 55%. Um, so 35% is not going to save you, especially with low armor that goes down even lower when you're in melee. Uh, moving on, we have the most interesting unit at the time when it was launched. We have the Yaogwai Hunters. So Yaogwai means monsters, so these are like kind of the... Uh, you can say the witcher version for the yellow turbans uh, they hunt monsters but in this case all that really means is they have poison arrow which was very very new at the time uh, recently with the bandit update you have poison arrows for all the bandits through the skill tree so these guys have lost a lot of the flavor but at the time when they were launched we can look at what they do they are very impressive they have stock they have snipe which means they can remain hidden in any terrain and they can remain hidden while firing so the whole idea is you have this invisible army anywhere on the map, including siege battles. You can walk up to towers without getting discovered, and you'll be able to just snipe at enemy units while staying hidden. Now the damage profile is very interesting. You see here, 5 range based damage, no armor piercing range damage. And what this really means is you're not doing anything with your arrows except for spreading the poison on the unit. So once you spread poison effect on the unit, it will last for 30 seconds and it will just basically bleed the enemy unit down. And you, what you want to do with these units is basically fire one volley at each of the enemy units and just wait. Wait till the poison effect goes away, then fire one again at each of the enemy unit. It's a very slow playstyle and these guys are fragile. If you do not keep them hidden, look at their stats. 26 morale, so anything happens to them, they die. And for a 120 unit, uh, infantry, you only have 40k health. So very low health, uh, they have very low charge bonus, very low attack, even though they are holding a mace, which I feel like should do a decent amount of damage, but apparently not. Uh, they can swing them really fast, so there's that. You have almost no melee evasion and almost no armor. So you're highly depending on the fact that you can remain hidden and the fact that you can cause scare which, you know, it's good. You can have a hidden unit that's causing scare to units around them and no one knows why. Uh, but aside from that, these are just precious snipers that's gonna poison the entire enemy army. So that kind of wraps up our Mandate of Heaven uh, preview of all the units. So let's go rank these guys in the tier list. Okay, so now that we've seen all the Mandate of Heaven units, including the Chen Royal Guards from Liu Chong's faction, you have the units from Lu Zhi as well as the Yellow Turbans, let's put them on this list. And obviously we have S through D, and I think the general rule is S tier is just godly units, they're just good, you're going to want to use them in all your campaigns, they're better than any alternative units, doesn't really matter what strategy you have, they have great value in terms of cost. A units are similar to S, but there's some shortcoming with that unit, maybe something very small. B is a very average unit, you want to use them, you don't avoid using the unit. And C is where you don't want to use the unit simply because there's a better alternative, and D is just trash tier units that are just bad, you should just stay away from, and you'll put a smile on your face if you see the enemy recruit these units. So that's kind of what we're going here. So starting with our first unit here, the Chen Royal Guards, these are available at rank 3. And they used to be S tier when they came out, when they had 250 range. They're very, very good. I'm still super tempted to put them into S tier, but I think, in all honesty, they're A tier unit. They're quite expensive for what they are. So if you want to just have a heavy range army with some standard frontline protection, you can do the same amount of damage with crossbow units. You don't necessarily need to go for Chen Royal Guards. If you want to spam a meme army with just one unit, then Chen Royal Guard is very good because they have good armor, they're decent in melee, and they can tank enemy cavalry with their mixed missile formation. But I don't think they're S tier anymore. Chen Royal Guards. Hmm. Let's see. I think Chen Royal Guards is actually S tier. So the reason for this is they have the melee cavalry buff against missile. They do different 
damages in terms they have their sword and shield as well as their crossbow their crossbow damage is good uh, they have good firing rate for crossbow they have good charge they're more versatile than chen royal guards they're also heavily armored uh, we'll kill their speed a little bit but because they're tanky they should be fine so i think i'm gonna put chen royal guard as s tier up here Next, we have uh, these frontline units from Ruzhi, and what we're going to do with these is, I think, we're going to put them as S tier. And the reason here is because they're unbreakable. So the only thing you want out of your frontline is can tank range damage and can hold the line. And these guys can do both of that. So they can hold the line forever until they entirely die off, and they can... Um, you know, tank up range damage with their shield and different formations. And then we have these Destroyer of Treachery. So they are the splash damage shot cavalry. And I think these guys, given that you unlock them at rank 6, I actually think these guys are just B tier. So I know splash damage is great. You do a lot of damage on enemy infantry, but shock damage... You know, from the cavalry with the charge bonus, you can do about the same amount of damage with just a regular uh, militia lancer cavalry, right? You just need to hold the front line, keep the enemy busy so that they have their flank exposed to you. You clear them up, charge them. But I think for the cost and the level you have to unlock them, I think they are just a B tier unit here. Uh, they're good, but I don't think I'll go for them. Now moving on to the yellow turban units, here's where things get a little iffy because they play quite differently. So Zhang Jiao's unit, you have to consider the fact that Zhang Jiao's faction don't actually mind taking casualties. So the fact that you have this melee cav that has double the unit size, that has no shield but still has a little bit of range block chance, does okay damage. I think these are A tier. Now the reason for these is... Yellow Turbans have not that many cavalry units to begin with, and by having this unique unit that's available at rank 3, that can sort of tank up range damage, have a larger size, and do a decent amount of charge, it's going to be very helpful for your campaign. So I feel like these are A-tier units. And then we have the Chosen of the Eight Immortals, high damage, small unit size unit for Zhang Jiao. Hmm. We also have to consider this from the scope of yellow turban units in general. And I think because of that, I think these guys are also A tier. So their clear weakness is they don't do well against range, but they do super well in melee. And you don't mind taking casualties as Zhang Jiao because you can heal up. And you have these units that can work with them to take out the enemy range. So I feel like in campaign, if you can recruit these at rank 6, you would want to spam them. Because they would be one of the top tier infantry units for your army. So I feel like it should be A tier. Now, I obviously haven't played a full John Zell campaign, so that opinion can change very quickly. But just looking at the stat and how the faction designed, I think this would be an A tier unit. Now, moving on to Zhang Liang. So we have a frontline unit here. And what I'm going to do with it is actually I'm going to put it in B tier. The reason here is because there's a stort shield unit, which is available for all yellow turban factions. It's 80% range block chance. It has pretty good morale. It's what you basically want in a frontline unit. And you have it available to uh, the right class starting at, you know, rank one. Uh, there's really no reason why you need to wait till rank three to get these units with a smaller shield and limiting formation with no turtle. Uh, and John Al's this defensive champion, so you'd be fighting a lot of defensive battles. I just don't see them as, you know, a standout unit. They don't do anything particularly well. They're just well-rounded, uh, similar to a spear guard replacement for the yellow turban, since the yellow turbans don't have spear guards. But because yellow turban have stored shield, which is actually better than spear guards in my opinion, these units are not very good, but they're not bad either. So I wouldn't put them C or D. I would just put them as B. And then we have Tyrant Slayer. So this is a fun unit, in my opinion. This is a general killer. Uh, you get these at rank 6. And actually, I think this unit is C. So 
you might think you know you do 300 percent extra damage to generals so you do four times as much you can just have these guys chase down enemy generals but that's not how usually generals work in the game and because you're playing yellow turban you have very strong powerful generals yourself you have skills like inner fire that boosts attack rate you have skills that like preach and condemn that does a lot of damage your generals are more than capable of dueling enemy generals and taking them out you don't actually need to chase any in general down with these like maybe the occasional stubborn strategist and you know sentinel commander doesn't want to duel you you might want to run these guys into them but i don't see value here you can easily kill off enemy generals with you know a lot of other units you don't need to actually have a specialized rank six unlocked unique unit to do so i think they are just there for you know thematic reasons i don't think they're very good i wouldn't spend any money recruiting them now moving on to Zhang Bao's unit so Zhang Bao is the offensive unit this is the pearl dragon clone and i feel like these zealots are probably c tier as well so they have a little bit of range block chance, but it's not high enough to warrant any frontline uh, status for these units. Stored shield being a shared unit is still better. Uh, you just want to hold. Uh, and even though these guys gain, you know, infinite uh, melee evasion sounds great, but you lose all your armor and you still get like at least a 20% chance to get hit. It's not going to tank you forever, especially with no armor. The arm, the arrows from basic archer militia is going to shred you as well. But I don't see how these guys are good. Now, Yelgwai Hunters are a little bit different. Yelgwai Hunters, they were really good when they came out because Poison Arrow was new. But with the Bandit revamp, now Poison Arrow is almost universal. Like You could get them in you know any faction. You just have to recruit like a Bandit strategist. But for yellow turbans, they can't do that. So this is the only poison unit for yellow turbans. But because of that, I think we drop them from S to A. Like you'll be playing yellow turban, they'll still be very useful. They have stock and snipe, which is probably the only unit that has that for yellow turbans. So you can even steal settlement gates with them. So I think they have a pretty nice purpose. Obviously, they're weak once they're exposed to combat, so they're not kind of all-around unit that I would put as S tier. But I think A tier is a fair grade for them. Okay, so that wraps up all our Mandate of Heaven. Let's cut back to preview. We'll look at all of the 190 Rise of Warlord factions. There's tons of them. And after we watch all of that, we'll come back and rank them as well. So see you guys then. Alrighty guys, so we're back to look at some of the 190 units. Now there's a lot of factions in 190, so it's going to take us, you know, a couple of preview sessions. We can't fit that many lords uh, into one uh, battle here. But starting with Liu Bei here, he has two unique units in the E Archer and E Marksman. And whenever you have two units, it's always the rank 3, rank 6, and they're clearly upgrade versions of each other. So just taking a quick look at the E Archer here, uh, they are excellent range units obviously with 200 range, pretty good attack, 40 and 24, fast firing, and what separates them from most other archers is the fact that they can fire while on the move. So you can move them forward, uh, not backward, you can't shoot backwards because the range indicator as you can see is always pointed to the front. So if you're walking backward, you can shoot at things that's behind you, it's fate, you're, whatever you're facing, uh, but Usually it only works as you walk towards the enemy unit and you can fire uh, as you walk. So that gives them a lot more damage output and the added mobility helps them relocate. And they have very low armor, but this gives them very good speed, which actually works in their favor as they can maneuver around flanks and get their arrow onto the enemy's back line pretty easily here. So overall, pretty good unit. Not very good in melee combat, as you can see. Uh, they do okay but you probably don't want them to be in melee with their armor they're going to rely heavily on their melee evasion decent amount of morale it's just a pretty average health not that high for a 120 unit uh, group here so very low health per unit but if we move on to their upgraded version which are available at rank 6 you see they get more morale they get more health still the same melee sword that they use for combat but you now have more armor trading off with slightly slower speed but you have the exact same bow damage. So if you're just gonna keep them well protected in the formation and not having them ever in melee combat, there's really no need to upgrade. 
For a lot of these heavy units that's designed in the game as the upgraded version, you are just going to end up wearing better armor, which obviously is helpful. You get more health per unit, which is helpful. But the melee weapon and the range weapon do not change. You don't get any extra range most of the time. And uh, there's really no reason to switch from these guys for these guys for just those three extra ammo, really. That's the amount of range damage you will do. Now, of course, if you're prone to throwing your infantry, uh, archers even, into melee combat, then definitely upgrade for better armor. But there's no reason to do that. So that wraps up Liu Bei's faction here. And moving on, we have Cao Cao. Uh, once again, let's take a look at his unique unit. So these are the heavy tigers in the leopard. Ooh, placed them a little bit wrong. But let's start over here then. We'll start with Tiger and Leopard Cavalry. So these are available at rank 3 for all generals. And the main difference is, uh, you know, once again, being heavy means you have more armor. So Tiger and Leopard, overall, they're saying well-rounded, low damage. And what they mean by low damage, um, it's not really reflective. They're saying basically you have a very low attack rate, most of your damage armor piercing, which I find actually very good. You're just not going to do most of your damage in melee. Most of your damage is going to come from your charge. So you're trying to charge in with 232 charge damage. It's not super high for Vanguard, uh, you know, shot cavalry, but it can be boosted. There are many skills on the Vanguard skill tree that can uh, boost this. You have a shield, which is rare for a shot cavalry, which means you have a decent amount of range block chance, allowing you to charge the back line a little bit better. Uh, you're not heavily armored as the regular Tiger and Leopard Cavalry, so you have decent amount of speed at 94, which as we mentioned before, it's good enough to run down generals and pin them down. Whereas the Heavy Tiger and Leopard, you're going to be wearing slightly better armor. So at this point, because you're wearing slightly better armor, you lose out a little speed, you get a little bit of extra shock damage, and you know if you look at the health, it doesn't change. But the morale uh, changed a little bit. You get 11 point more morale. So most of the time, I would actually prefer not to uh, change the unit because you lose a lot of speed, right? Because of that little bit of armor you gain, you actually lose a lot of speed. So perhaps just stick to the rank three one. They're cheaper and it's available much quicker. Moving on, we have Sun Jian. So Sun Jian's unit are much, uh, you know, different than the other factions. They have a lot of things that's off uh, combat wise you can't see on the unit card. Basically since they're mercenary units they come fully mustered. That is a fact that we're going to keep in mind going forward. And because you have three unique units they are available at different ranks. So when there's three units it's usually one unit. In this case the infantry that's available at rank one. The archer is available at rank three and the cavalry is available at rank five. So one three five instead of the standard three and six. Which means you get your unique units faster. Right, you get the infantry right away. The weakness of this mercenary infantry is that they do not have a good defense against cavalry, but they have access to formations unlike axe bands. So you can actually put yourself in shield wall to gain some charge negate. And obviously if you have him on sentinel, you can get the charge negate skill uh, just to get them innate charge negate uh, to begin with. Now we don't see the formation here because this army has no strategist. So uh, they don't have access to any formations, but they do have shield wall. I can confirm that, So that will help them greatly. A uh, decent amount of health, a decent amount of damage pretty good attack rate and because they're axe unit they can have the 35% uh, debuff to enemy shield evasion as well as shield armor so you basically wipe out their armor stats here as you attack enemies with shield they have pretty good range block chance that can be elevated with the shield wall formation we mentioned earlier their only weakness really is the low morale 32 I mean it's not super low but if you think about it if you get into a tough fight where you're getting night battled then you're losing about 15 right off the bat if you're getting shot by archers getting hit by fire the morale comes down pretty quickly ideally if you want a sturdy front line unit you want something with higher morale than 32. but overall since they're cheap they're readily available uh, i can't really complain and fault them for being 32 morale being a rank one recruitable unit uh, moving on we have the mercenary archers now these guys have even lower morale, but that's because they are mercenary, they're archer units, so that makes sense. They have low armor, low melee evasion. What you really want to look at is their range damage profile. And if you look at their range damage profile, this reminds you of a unit right away, and that's the E archers. All right, look at it. As a level three mercenary archer, they have the same ammo, 
same damage profile as a level 6 available E marksman. The difference is you can't fire while on the move. That's the only trade-off. But if you also notice their melee weapon, they use an axe. Which means they can also bring out the same debuff to enemy shield and armor once they go into melee. Versus the sword that's used by these units. So this makes mercenary archers very very strong. And uh, despite the fact they're you know not designed for combat because they're very low armor. But when you're in a pinch, having an axe is better than having a sword. Especially if you have a better uh, melee damage profile. 30, 6, 26 versus this 30, 23, 13. So having more armor piercing is obviously better here and you can debuff the enemy shield armor and shield evasion on top of that. And you have the exact same uh, range damage, range attack speed, and ammo situation as the base unique unit. So that really makes uh, these units not shine as much as uh, they should. Moving on, we have Mercenary Cavalry. So despite the fact that they're available at rank 5, they don't wear any heavy armors, which is kind of the theme with most mercenary units. And another theme with most mercenary units is the low morale. Uh, dangerously low morale for a cavalry unit uh, such as this. So that's their only weakness. They have great charge. Uh, they have very, very high armor piercing damage for a cavalry unit. Uh, so that's that's all pluses. They wear just the amount, you know, just the right amount of armor in my opinion to get that 75% speed. It's slow, but it protects them a little bit. And uh, you want definitely use these to clear uh, enemy units without putting them under fire because they're not good against Archer and if they take any amount of sustained damage. It's really going to hurt their morale even more. And that's the only problem you'll run into them. Um, so that's Sun Jian's mercenary units. Moving on, we have the Yuan brothers starting with Yuan Shu. So Yuan Shu has two unique infantry. One is the Rapid Tiger infantry here. Um, they are bad. Let's just say they are bad. I am in the middle of a Yuan Shu campaign and these guys are just bad. Um, the reason why they're bad is not really visible in their unit card. Uh, they are weak against cavalry, right? Because they are uh, melee infantry with sword. They're weak against archers and any range damage because they have no range block chance and they're not wearing heavy armor either. 32% is not heavy. You need to be above 50 to be considered kind of a heavy unit. They have good melee evasion, which is nice. So technically, if you throw these guys in melee combat, they'll do pretty well. 24 attack speed is not super high. You know, we've seen 40 attack speed. Uh, the damage profile is okay, 26, 32. Uh, charge is okay, 103. High morale, that's that's what they're good at, high morale, which means they'll end up taking a lot of casualties. They won't route, they'll just keep fighting, they don't have a lot of armor, they'll just bash it out until they, you know, they drop. That's kind of their situation right here. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say about these guys. Let's look at their upgraded version, the Warriors of the Left. Now, clearly visible upgrade, you're wearing more armor and you're getting a lot more uh, melee evasion as well. 58% melee evasion, 53% armor. So now you're technically a heavy unit. You can tank some of those basic archer damage if they're heavily skewed towards uh, base damage for range. Uh, if they're armor piercing crossbowmen, you're still gonna get shredded. Uh, the sword did not improve. The morale did, the charge did, and uh, you're basically just a beefier version of the rapid tiger infantry and you can use these guys in melee combat that's where they're most effective and once again they're going to be weak to cavalry because they can't get run down they're going to be weak to range units uh, at least you know you're still going to take a lot of damage with no range block chance moving on to the other yuan brother we have a very similar setup you have two units but instead of swordsmen we have z infantry so first we have warrior of Ye here if you look at the stat it's very similar to rapid tiger very very similar so the thing is, you have the same attack speed, very similar melee damage, and what you have is you know a decent morale unit, decent charge, no range block chance. But you know what? At least you're good against cavalry, right? At least you can stop cavalry. So that's what set these guys apart. You're weak to cavalry and archers. You're only weak to archers. And if we look at the upgraded versions, a very similar upgrade, you're wearing extra armor. And you're going to have that extra armor, 53%, pretty heavy unit, pretty good morale, a little bit better extra charge, um, but that's about it. You have less evasion because you're not as nimble holding a long pole arm, but you're protected from cavalry. So that's something you have going for you. 
Um, I don't like the Yuan Brothers' unique units, but that's not just a opinion, just from practice, they're not very good. Moving on, we have Gong Sun Zan with his white horse cavalry here. Everyone's wearing a white horse, and the reason for this historically is because he has so much success fighting the nomadic tribes in the north with some of his cavalry units that had white horses, that the nomadic tribes become fearful of white horse cavalry units. So Gong Sun Zan played on that fear by recruiting only white horses for his army to give the impression of his elite force always being around. So that's why he's the white horse general here. And we're looking at uh, white horse fellows, which is actually the upgraded version. So let's actually look at these guys first. White horse raiders. So once again, we got a few things to notice. They have good charge, you know, for uh, essentially a cavalry horseback archer. You have the same charge as a uh, shock cavalry. You know, you're over 200 charge. That's impressive. You have the standard health, pretty good morale. 43 is not bad, especially if you consider this mercenary cavalry only has 25, right? And you have a little bit less charge damage, uh, charge bonus than them, but it's good. You have fast melee attack rate once you get into melee combat. You have good melee evasion, decent amount of armor to not slow you down, to give you good speed. And if you look at the range situation, which is, you know, your main feature, you have really fast firing rate, 27 at rank one. And that number will go up as you rank up. So you shoot really, really fast. And I believe uh, White Horse Raiders and White Horse Fella can shoot while on the move. So you can kite and shoot at the same time. And you have the same damage profile as the E Archers and the Mercenary Archers, 40, 24. Uh, and, but you shoot much faster than them, you have more ammo, and you're on horseback. So, great unit. Uh, moving on, we have their upgraded version here, White Horse Fella. So the melee portion did not change. Uh, you have slightly higher armor, 5% more. And the thing here is you get more ammo, but if you notice here, you get more range. You get 250 range. So these guys and the Onyx Dragons are now the only 250 range units left in the game, and that really sets them apart. Uh, I have a theory where this unit didn't get patched up correctly on patch 1.5, and they didn't get hit with the range nerf, they didn't get hit with the speed buff, and they didn't get hit with the rebalancing of the cost. So there could be changes to this unit in the future, but at the current point in the game, I think we're on patch 1.5.3, this unit is excellent. They're cheap. They're even cheaper to upkeep than White Horse Raiders, which is ridiculous. They have 50 extra range, you have ridiculously high amount of ammo, you got ridiculously high firing speed, and you do very good damage. 4820 is very high archer damage. So that wraps up this group of the units. Let's move on to the next group. Alrighty, continuing with our 190 uh, factions, we're going to continue with Dong Zhuo here. Uh, we're not going to do the bandits yet, we'll do the bandits with the 194 factions from A World Betrayed. Uh, the reason for that is just because the bandit got revamped and Yan Baihu was kind of in between. So we'll just do that in another uh, preview. So before we rank these 190 base Han factions, I guess we can call them that, let's finish things up with Dong Zhuo here with the Silan Cavalry. So Silan Cavalry here uh, is a pretty decent shot cavalry unit, 280 charge is very high. You have a very good damage profile with 44 armor piercing damage, low evasion, kind of low armor, uh, but that's good because you get higher speed. Uh, the main thing is it's a raider unit, it will burn down buildings, which is great for settlement fights because you want to damage the settlements. So they are alternative to having fire arrows. You also have immune to scare as well as causing, uh, you don't have causing scare, but you have resistant, but that's from the skill tree. So that, that's not relevant. The raider is kind of what's uh, making them different here. And moving on to their upgraded version here, you see the main difference is just heavier armor, slower speed, and higher charge. Um, so you might want to consider not upgrading, right? You're not getting that much benefit by upgrading and losing that speed. Uh, now obviously if you're doing just hammer and envoy where you're coming in behind to enemy melee lines that's already kind of stuck there with your melee line, then speed doesn't really matter and being heavier uh, it's going to cause more charge damage uh, so maybe you want that uh, depends on the phase of the game you're in and how you play uh, but if you're short on money uh, you know the regular version do just fine so they're available rank three rank six and then we have the most interesting set of units so this is the Tiang ethnic set that belongs to ma teng 
Um, so starting off the game, when it was first launched, you had three different town units. You have the town marauders, which is a shot cavalry. These are available at rank one. You have the town hunters, which is a bow and glaive dual weapon horseback unit, which are available at rank three. And then finally you have town raiders, which is a melee cav that's available at rank five. And then you have three new infantry that were added into the game in later patches. So let's start with this rank one unit. So if we take a look at it, very high charge, right? Very high charge, 303. And on top of this, all town cavalry units are fatigue immune. So you are never going to get tired during the length of a battle. You can keep running down enemies. You can keep coming back to charge. All the time will be full speed. When you're fatigued, you lose speed, you lose damage, you lose combat effectiveness. But these units are tip top shape. And they're very good if you're patient in a long fight to just kite the enemy till they get tired and then you can kill them easier with your fatigue immune troop so this is just a very strong shot cavalry unit and if we compare them you know to like say the sealant cavalry you're pretty much on par slightly less armor but you have higher charge uh, similar uh, morale same exact spear you're holding 20 10 44 in terms of the attack rate and the damage profile uh, same speed, so great unit, uh, fatiguing me on top of that. Moving on to these uh, archers, uh, if we notice the archer profile here, 250 range, so onyx dragon range, similar to white horse fellas, 48, 22 damage profile, so actually even higher damage than some of the archers we've seen with 40 and 24, I believe was the ratio, so good damage, extremely, extremely high firing rate. 60 that's nuts that's just insane and you have the highest range in the game now you have a lot of ammo you don't get tired you can kite forever you have good amount of armor that doesn't kill your speed you have good amount of melee evasion and once you finish shooting you have a pretty good weapon as well i think they use like a spear as well or what is that the axe no a glaive a glaive okay and then you have, you know, a little slower attack speed, but decent damage, decent charge. Um, just the bow factor. The bow factor and the fact that you can't get tired makes them really, really great. Now, the problem is there's some cavalry units that are going to be faster than you, right? 94 speed is not the fastest in the game. So you definitely want to use maybe your other units to tire them out first before having these guys just harassed forever. And just can't say enough about these units. They're really, really good. And then we have the Town Raiders. So this is the melee cavalry version. 65% uh, range block chance that can go up to 85 if you have a commander as the unit leading it with the skill Nobility Unlocked. Um, same speed, same armor, uh, similar evasion. Pretty good charge damage for a uh, melee cav. 254 is very high. And you have a decent amount of morale. And uh, the damage profile is not so great, but you're mainly going to use these guys to harass enemy archers. So that's kind of their purpose, and they do just fine. It's a little bit of a shame that they're unlocked at rank 5, though. That's pretty far uh, into the game for most. It's not going to be an early game unit. Getting to rank 3 and unlocking Town Hunters is pretty central. Uh, but by that time, you might not need these guys. Now we have some more flavorful units. So these are the Town Infantry that were added into the game, starting with the Town Poarm. And what we have to consider here is... Um, these units are available once you unlock the unique building for uh, Matone's faction. And once you have that, you can recruit these units. And they're they're okay. Uh, if we look at the stats, they're better than militia units. 44 armor piercing on a spear unit is pretty good. It's a low armor, low morale unit, so they're not strong. But if you're comparing them to a Z militia, it's pretty comparable. And probably prefer these guys. Uh, no shield, so not strong uh, in terms of frontlining, but maybe you can use them in ambush, run them out, or maybe hide them in the forest and wait for the cavalry to run into them. Moving on, we have Town Warriors. Now these guys have an axe and a mace, very interesting weapon choices. And because they have an axe, they are good against enemy shielded units, they are better morale, better charge, and better damage profile than the pole, uh, pole arm unit we just saw. And, but they, they have no shield as well, so once again you probably want to ambush fight, you want something to close gap, or maybe you just want your cavalry to run down the enemy range units first, and then just have these guys charge in for 
uh, damage here. So, a uh, pretty good unit. And then moving on here, we have Tian Archers. So these are you know, slightly better than Archer Militias. They're kind of on par with regular Archers. 25, 18 for the damage, but they fire fast. 22 is very fast. So that's where they win versus regular Archers. You have extra fast attack speed. So it seems like the Tian Tribes are just very good with the bow in terms of putting out a lot of damage really fast. And that's kind of what sets them apart. Their melee stats are really not worth talking about. Also very low morale, that's kind of their weakness. Uh, but these are just new flavor units added in for Matong's faction. So now he has six unique units, basically. Uh, some of these might not be unique soon. Let's say if Han Sui becomes playable, I'm sure Han Sui will get these uh, Tiang infantry at least. Not sure if he will get the same Tiang cavalry. Uh, moving on, we have Liu Biao. And Liu Biao starts out with infantry of Jin starting at level 3. Uh, these guys are just sturdier versions of the spear guards. You have very similar stat to the spear guard with higher morale as kind of their calling card. Uh, so they're just very good fighter, sustained fighter, good against range, good against cavalry. Uh, obviously they're going to be weak against axe units. So that's kind of their counter, but very good unit for a front line. And their upgraded version, the Imperial Defender, is even better. So you have higher armor, bigger shield, bigger range block chance, you have more morale. Uh, the damage is still the same, so these guys are just kind of your front line to hold the enemy infantry in place, to maybe allow your cavalry to flank behind for the hammer envoy tactic, or just, you know, hold so your range unit stays safe and can fight from behind. Alright, moving on, we have Tao Tian. He's one of the free LC lords that's added recently with World Betrayed, and his units are territorial spearmen and territorial archers. They're both available rank 3, they're both terrible. So, they're basically worse than Z Militias in my opinion. Uh, if you look at the damage profile, you almost have no charge, you have very low morale, you have heavily skewed towards base melee damage, which is strange because most spear units are based towards armor piercing. Uh, if you look at even the Tiang pole arm, look at it, it's 44 armor piercing, 20 attack speed. This is the same 20 attack speed, but most of the damage is on base damage, so it makes them actually weaker. You have very bad stats. Now obviously you do have a passive ability. If you're on defense, your melee damage will go up by 10%, your armor your armor piercing damage will go up by 10%, your morale will go up by 10 points, and your melee evasion will go up by 10%. So the 10% here for CA stats all messed up, it's basically add 10, right? That's how you gotta think about it. So 38 will go to uh, 48, uh, the 33 go to 43, and 14 will go to like 24. Uh, melee evasion goes up to 16. Uh, it's a little funky with the math, but uh, I think that's how it works. Uh, you get 10 morale. That's saving grace, but you get to 32 morale, it's not good, right? 32 is not good. That's what we criticize the mercenary infantry for. And you're not good against range, sure, you're good against cavalry, but like at this morale level, this armor level, this range block chance level, you're not going to stay on the field. So don't see why we would ever use them. Territory archers are slightly better than territorial spearmen, simply because the damage profile is better than archers. 31-18 is pretty good. Um, it's not as good as all the other archer units we've seen for most unique archer units, uh, but you get a lot of ammo, you get decent fast attack rate. So if you're using them as archer replacement, sure. And, uh, you know, you can also get the same boost on defense, uh, more damage, which is amazing, and also uh, more morale, which is okay, because, you know, archers have low morale anyway, so if you go to 35, it's decent. You can keep these guys safe in the back, so they're not going to lose a lot of morale, and then melee evasion is not really relevant here. But that's pretty much uh, the territorial unit, not much to say. And finally, we move on to Kong Rong with his uh, Fury of Beihai and uh, Thunder of Jian'an. So Fury of Beihai here used to be uh, this amazing crossbow units, right? You have 250 range. Well, 250 range is gone, but you have 220. So you still outrange almost all range units in the game. So that's still good. You have a ton of ammo, uh, mainly because Kong Rong's leading it, so you have like high cunning. I think the base ammo is around 27, which is decent for uh, range units and it's fair because you got to consider them being used in a campaign profile so uh, you know you're going to put them on someone with high cunning so you're going to get a lot of art, uh, arrows out anyways 
Uh, 54 armor piercing damage, that's where they really stand out. They have pretty good attack rate for crossbowmen, usually it's around 5 or 6. They start out at 9 and as they rank up it'll go up. So overall you're looking at this you know, very high damaging crossbow unit that shoots faster than most crossbow unit and also shoot farther. So you really can't complain about them, they're still one of the best crossbow units in the game. Uh, obviously compare them to the Chen Royal Guards which has less range but heavier armor and also more self-reliant on protecting themselves with their formations and their combat capabilities. Here, your guys have almost no armor and almost no combat capabilities. But if you upgrade them to Thunder Jian, you get a little bit more armor. You get a little bit more uh, morale and uh, you know a little bit more ammo on top of that. Uh, but other than that, you know you have the exact same crossbow, exact same crossbow skill. The damage profile range and attack rate is not going to change, so it's not really worth upgrading. Uh, many of these units, you know, once they become available in rank 3, you start using them and then leveling them up. You don't need to upgrade them once you get to rank 6. Uh, the reward is very minimal. Um, just keep your higher level uh, units that you've been using and they're cheaper. So that kind of wraps up our 190 uh, faction unique units. Let's go rank these guys on the tier list. Alrighty, so that's a lot of factions, and let's rank them slowly. So starting with the ones we introduced first, we have Liu Bei with the E Archers and E Marksmen. And the damage profile on these units are just not very high. And you get these at rank 3 and rank 6. Obviously the E Marksmen is actually worse in value compared to E Archers, so I don't know. They... You know, the standout thing about them is they fire on the move and they move fast. That's because they have low armor. So I actually think E Marksman is C and E Archer is. Mm, it, it's close. I actually want to put them just slightly ahead of E Marksman and put them as C as well. Because if we realistically think about how a campaign plays out, by the time you want to recruit these guys, playing as the Obey first off, you have militia discounts. So in the early game, you're going to be spamming Archer Militia. No matter how much they nerf Archer Militia, it's just so cheap and efficient way to kill enemy units early on that you're going to spam them. And then by the time you hit mid game, you should probably have access to either archers or onyx dragons to be honest you can get onyx dragons by turn 45 which at that point i wouldn't recruit these guys and then by the late game you have high level onyx dragons you have imperial crossbowmen you can use so i don't see them ever being used in a campaign they're not bad unit they're not trashed here right they're not d but, and then if you see the enemy having them, you'd be a little worried because they do good damage. But I just don't see them fitting in in a player campaign. So I think they're C units with the archer better than the marksman because you get them earlier and they're cheaper and they do about the same thing. All right, moving on to Tall Tall's unit, Tiger and Leopard Cavalry and Heavy Tiger and Leopard Cavalry. So these guys are questionable too. I think these units are going to be hmm. I want to put this unit as A tier and this unit as B tier. This one's close to B. Now, the reason for this is you have access to these quite early compared to most heavy cavalry because you rarely want to go down the red tree towards the horse pasture playing as tall tall to get cataphracts. And even if you get cataphracts, cataphracts don't have shield, so they don't have range block chance as a shock cavalry. You want to go all the way to Jade Dragon, which takes so many reform that you're really not going to ever see Jade Dragons in your games. So with this fact, the fact that you have a shock cavalry with shield makes them stand out. And they have pretty good charge. It also has a lot of ways to reduce cost of retinues, so they're not going to be too expensive. So I think they're an A tier shot cavalry unit. Now of course you can use Lancer Militia to do a lot of the same thing they do, but once you get your economy rolling in the mid game, I think they're a good upgrade option for your early Militia Lancer cavalry, which makes them a pretty good bulk of your army in the mid to late game. 
but I think they're A tier and these heavy version are B tier. Like you would recruit them for the better armor, but you could just do better off with the basic version earlier on at rank three and just level them up. You're not gonna get that many rank six, you know, Vanguard generals playing as Tall Tall. Most of your generals are champions. Uh, so you still want only these on uh, Vanguard units. You're not gonna spam them on everyone. So that's kind of why I think they're A rather than S. Um, I think they're closer to B, if anything. But let's hang on to that. All right, now we have Sun Jian's mercenary units. These guys I absolutely adore. So, mercenary infantry is S tier. Mercenary archer is S tier. Mercenary cavalry is A or maybe even B tier, actually. I think they're going to be A tier. Okay, so let's talk about these for a while. These units replenish right away. When you summon them, they're full. That makes them S tier automatically. You can recruit these at level one on any general, which means you have immediate defense anywhere on the map you want. You can spam these guys out on an empty general that you deploy and they'll be ready to fight right away. Not only that, with the new introduction of the Imperial units in the late game, you can recruit these at a cheap cost on any general and then immediately swap them to an Imperial unit so that they can trade the replenishment rate. You don't have to wait for a very slow ramp up mustering and replenishment of Imperial units that are ranked 10 automatically, but instead you can just pay a little bit extra to get these guys out, swap, and then your Imperial army is ready to fight right away. So they are great. Mercenary Archer does the same exact amount of damage as E Archers. You get them at rank 3, they're immediately ready to fight. They're very useful. If you're going to spam defense, these are the two go to units. So these two are S tier. A tier for the Mercenary Cavalry because it has really, really low morale. So you might not want to use these in the late game, but they become mustered right away. So that's, that's their, you know, thing. That's the thing. You get them ready right away. You have double charge pretty much every game playing as whether Sun Jian or Sun, uh, Sun Ce because Sun Ce has that background bonus that doubles the charge bonus of all cavalry. So these guys will have 550 charge, which makes them insane in your games. And you can get them ready right away. They kill generals way faster than uh, tyrant slayers. So I think they're at least an A tier. They're not S tier just because they're not durable. So if you could, you know, build these and then use the swap method to get yourself, you know, cataphracts that comes at 100 unit instead of 120 right away they're pretty much on par and you can use that that swap to give yourself cataphract before rank 5 i think it's better than wait till rank 5 to go for these so i think they're a tier now moving on we have yuan shu okay so no surprise trash tier um trash tier but they're better than these so you do have better armor, so that's good, because there's no defense whatsoever for these guys. You would never want to recruit these unless you're doing a one retinue challenge, which I'm doing in my Renshu campaign, or else you won't even see these units on the map. They're just bad. They're weak against everything in the game. Like, name one unit they're strong against. They're not strong against shielded spearmen, because you want axe for that. They're strong against themselves. But, like, when would you see that matchup? They're expensive. You need to wait till rank 3 and rank 6 to recruit them. Just absolutely terrible units. Now moving on to Yuan Shao. These come right next to them. They're slightly better, but just slightly. They beat cavalry. That's it. That's that's what they have over them. Um, maybe these guys will even beat these guys in melee if they just duel because you have higher melee evasion. But overall, terrible units. And it doesn't matter, I guess, for Yuan Shao in particular that these units are bad. It does matter for Yuan Shu. Basically, you have no unique unit that's worth talking about. For Yuan Shao, you don't care because you're spamming Captain Red News anyways in your campaign. So you'd be using just a massive amount of basic units. And you don't really need these guys. Now, the AI like to recruit them quite a bit. And you can easily kill them with archers. Um, so there's that. But you can't kill them very well with cavalry. So they, they're good against something. 
All right, moving on to Gongsun Zan. So we have good units here, finally. We don't have to talk about trash tier. We have White Horse Raiders and White Horse Fellows. Um, White Horse Raiders hmm, are probably B tier. And White Horse Fellow is S tier. So the reason why is this is 200 range. The damage is not... Uh, outstanding. I mean, it's better than the standard mounted archer, so that makes them a good unit. Uh, you would still want to use them, but they're expensive. They got patched up in 1.5. They didn't get changed in terms of recruitment cost ratio. We talked about this a lot in our Gongsun Zan's uh, early game playbook, guys. Upkeep cost 150, upkeep cost 220, I believe. So it doesn't make sense the higher tier one. The only you know thing that's holding this back is you need to wait till rank six to recruit them, but they're so worth it. Like they're onyx dragons on horseback. So definitely use this in your army. All right, moving on, we have Dong Zhuo Xidang Cavalry. So let's see, Dong Zhuo Xidang Cavalry, rank three, rank six. I think the way we want to rank these is we want to put these as B units and then these as C units. So you would use these. Uh, they have good charge. Um, they are prone to archer damage. They're prone to spear. Um, they will replace your lancer cavalry. They will not change your game in making them easier. They're just basically a very standard shot cavalry unit that you can use that has better stats, similar to many of the units in rank B. Um, rank C, because you never really recruit this. Like you probably be happy with a high tier uh, see down cavalry, you don't need to go to the heavy version. Similar case to Tal Tal's unit. This is one tier down. Now moving on, we have Ma, uh, Ma Teng's unit. The Tel units are coming out. So Tel Marauders, S tier. Uh, you get them starting at rank one on all generals, so you can kind of uh, run down um, enemy units. Um, it actually might be rank three. But anyways, you get these quite early. And uh, you can use this to exhaust the enemy force. Run you what, what you want to do with these guys is you want to run them to multiple corners of the map in vision of the enemy. So they split up their force to chase after you. And you just tire them out. And then you pick your fight. You pick the wrong unit that's chasing you. Let's say a saber militia is chasing you. Well, charge them down. If it's a Z militia, you just keep them walking until they get super tired and you loop back to the main force. So you spread your force out in the beginning and then you rapidly concentrate your force while the AI is tired and spread out and you can pick easy targets. So they're very, very strong for that. These are god tier. Um, these are probably not in order up here on S. It's fine. Uh, some of these I'm trying to keep in order, but uh, this is probably one of the best units in the game, Tail Hunter. Never gets tired, 250 range, has a pretty good melee mode on top of that. So they're even better than uh, these White Horse Fellows uh, in that aspect. They're very close, so I think these are like slightly better than them. Uh, I think if we want to order these, I think we want to order them like this. These are the best. The fact that you get them mustered right away, instant defense. You never have to pay upkeep because you can just disband them right away. They just they just change the game, like Sun Jian and Sun Sun needs any more help, but they're just amazing if you utilize them right in your campaign. Just an absolute monster of a unit, very strong. I think the patch had an oversight, so maybe this will get nerfed back to maybe A tier. Um, but also, Fatigue Immune changes the game. Uh, just a strong unit overall that you can spam in any kind of general. Also, just a strong unit. Um, the Tiang... Uh, melee cavalry, I think is A tier, simply because you have to wait till too high of a rank to recruit these, and you can do the same with just militia, um, you know, cavalry unit. You just will use these to kind of kite the enemy. You don't need to use these to kite the enemy, right? They never hit you because you have speed advantage. So I don't see the purpose of these guys. Now, obviously, if you have money and you want to recruit these, they're good. You know, they're definitely A tier unit. The fact that they're fatiguing you. Uh, but I think they can do most of the job here. As for the infantry, hmm, I think for the Cheng O arm unit, it's probably D tier. I would probably never recruit them if I'm playing a game. You probably just do spear guards, unless you're doing like a Cheng unit only type of campaign. Other than that, I don't see a reason why you would recruit them. 
Town archers, I would recruit over standard archer militias early on. I think they're B tier. These axe units are quite unique in the game. I think they're also B tier. Okay, moving on to Liu Biao, infantry of Jin. Okay, so they're going to be your spear guard replacement. The fact that you can spam them on any general type is very useful. Opens up the option for a different type of army composition. So I think that actually changes the game quite a bit. So I would actually put them A tier. These guys are better, but they're going to wait till a higher tier to recruit. So they're less flexible. So I think these are A and B. This one's closer to B than S uh, for sure. And then moving on, we have territorial unit from Tao Qian. Uh, definitely trash tier worst unit in the game i see no reason to ever recruit these guys uh, they cost more than z militia and i don't think they outperform z militia by much and archers is okay to recruit but i oh man they might even be b tier yeah they're like low b high c because they're better than archer militias. They have the same range of archer. You don't need a reform to unlock them. And they get extra bonuses if they get attacked. So for defensive army with range, they're decent. Yeah, I think they're B tier. Wow, I'm shocked. Uh, but this is absolutely trash. All right, Fury of Beihai, Thunder of Jian. So these were really, really good units back in the day when they had 250 range. But if Chen Royal Guard is A, they have 220 range, so they're not terrible. Hmm. The problem is they're competing against Onyx Dragons now because they don't have the same range, so it's difficult. Hmm, would I want to spam them in all armies? I think you would. I think if you're playing as Coral, these would be S tier for you. These would be probably B tier. Because you wouldn't want to recruit these. It's extra cost. You get these way later. You can have higher level uh, Fury of Beihai already. I just think you don't have an opportunity to recruit these. right? So if this falls down because of that, this definitely falls down because of that. Now, you wouldn't put it as C tier because these are still very strong. Um, I think that's, that's fair. I don't think it's A tier either because this is kind of in between A and S right now. I think this is kind of between A and B, but closer to B. All right, so that wraps up all the 190 uh, Han factions. We're going to take a preview look at all the World Betrayed unit as well as the Bandit units. So see you guys after that. Alrighty guys, so let's wrap up this preview session uh, with the uh, World Betrayed units as well as the Bandit units. So starting with a new World Betrayed unit under Lu Bu's faction, we have the Camp Crushers. So Camp Crushers are these elite unit based on history of an elite group of 700 warriors that Gaoshun trained and they're known to, you know, jump into the enemy camp and, you know, just wreck it. So here we have just this assault uh, unit, you know, very, very high charge damage for a melee unit, ridiculously high, a pretty good amount of morale, splash damage because of the giant sword, and on top of that, you know, they have... Um, charge negation versus mounted which is given to them because this sword similar to Jama Jian's unit is counter cavalry meant to chop off the heads and limbs of horses you also have a pretty balanced attack profile you're slow hitting but you do splash damage so that's good you also wear very heavy armor 53% is very heavy and you don't have any uh, protection from range because you're using a two-handed giant sword so definitely if you can keep these guys safe and then just launch them into the enemy front line or you know rear charge them you're gonna do a lot of damage you're gonna kill off enemy infantry very very fast and you can stand your ground against enemy cavalry because you have charge negate so pretty good well-rounded new unit uh, as with most dlcs you have one or two factions with really amazing units and this is definitely one of them moving on we have the flying riders so these two units uh whereas the camp pressure is available at rank three these flying riders are available rank 6. Now, of course, Lu Bu also has access to the same Xiliang cavalries from Zhong Zhuo, but we've already shown that, so we're not going to show it here. The so flying riders are available rank 6, which makes them a little problematic in my book because you get them so late and you get them in Lu Bu's faction only, which means you have access to Xiliang cavalry much earlier. And although we don't have a direct comparison here, I can tell you Xiliang cavalry have better charge 
and also faster speed because they wear less armor, which you might think is not a good thing, but for cavalry, especially shot cavalry, having, having a higher speed is great. You can close gaps on, you know, range unit that could be killing you uh, much better rather than tanking out those arrows for longer. So overall, I don't think they have any use simply because Nupu's faction would just simply use Silent Cavalry, and by the time you unlock them, they just underperform versus the same unit in the faction. So, um, not a bad unit. The design is good, just you have a better unit, so you would never use them. All right, moving on to Sun Ce, who is taking over Sun Jian's faction in World Betrayed, and you have access to all the mercenary units, which we've gone over. But in addition, you get two additional units Handmade Guard, which you get at rank 3. They represent uh, Lady Sun personal bodyguards. And they come with this new ability called Guard, which grants 25% damage resistance to General. This has been nerfed once already, uh, but still pretty good. You know, your Generals, if they're in duel, they're in a frontline fight, they're in a backline fight, doesn't matter where they're fighting, 25% extra damage resistance is going to be very helpful. And this grants them to nearby Generals. And since they are melee uh, cavalry, you do have at least 20% range block chance, even though you're not holding shields, and you still automatically have 50% missile resistance which makes them pretty good at chasing out archers, uh, you know, decent enough, uh, basically. And damage-wise, they're not really there for damage. Uh, they have okay charge for melee cav, okay speed. They're really there just to accompany your general. You need basically just one of them, just to follow your general around uh, to do the fighting. Um, but pretty well-designed unit. Moving on, at rank 6, we have access to Tiger Guards. So these obviously, just by the look, you know they are spear guard replacement unit, very similar damage profile, very similar armor, very similar range block chance, and they have decent uh, morale. I would say they're basically spear guard clones, except they get the guard passive as well. So this is for your strategists and your commanders who are staying in the back, and these guys are guarding your front line while boosting those generals damage resistant, and if the enemy general charge in, you can try to dismount them with formations, and you can also uh, you know, protect your own generals in the fight with enemy generals that get to your front line. So definitely a pretty good unit. Uh, you do get them a bit late, you know, rank 6 is quite late. By that time, you can get the greater upgraded version of the Spear Guard, so you might want to think about which unit you want on your front line, but they're pretty good. Uh, moving on, we are at the Bandit Factions. So first up is Zhang Yan here. So Zhang Yan has three unique units, so once again, it will follow the Rank 1, Rank 3, and Rank 5 unlock uh, progression here. And at level 1, you get Black Mountain Marauders. So the whole playstyle of Giant's faction is ambush, ambush, ambush. So your units will have, you know, ambush traits like, you know, it will cause scare. You will have uh, guerrilla deployment. Uh, you will also have, uh, well, you have raider because you're a bandit, so you light things on fire. But if you just consider what they're used for, they're going to be close range charging units out of, you know, ambush forest. And they have pretty decent high attack for that. They use axe, so they will kill the enemy shield. They also have a pretty good damage profile, fast swing dual axe with 39 armor piercing damage, pretty good melee evasion, uh, not much armor, but they're basically there to shock and awe with their scare on top of that. And ambush fights, you know, you're going to have the morale advantage in the beginning anyways. So overall, very good unit. Uh, once you reach rank 3, you have access to Black Mountain Outlaws. So these guys, I find their role to be a little confusing. Because you're really in a lot of ambush fights, right? So the fact that they have no range protection is fine because you'd be charging out. They have okay charge damage, 94. But their main selling point should be that the fact that they're, you know, pole arm units with high armor piercing that's good against anti cav. But in, an in ambush fights, the cavalry is not really going to be charging you anywhere. So you're not really going to get the charge reflect off on them. So I don't know why you would need these units, right? Compare them to. The rank one version, the Marauders, which has a you know a better damage profile in my opinion with the 30 attack speed, and also the fact that you know you can kill off shield units much easier. Uh, if the enemy cavalry can't charge, why don't you go with the higher morale, higher charge damage uh, unit that just will do more damage? So, my opinion, these guys doesn't have, really have a role in the army. But once you reach rank five. You get access to what's called the Black Mountain Hunters. So these are uh, archer units, but 
Uh, aside from being an archer unit, they also carry around an axe with them. So they're also good in melee. And they are not the hiding type of archers. There's no stock uh, available to them. Although you could try to get them stock through the skill tree of the bandits now. Uh, but what you basically want to do with these is during the beginning of an ambush fight, uh, shoot a couple of rounds at whatever unit's vulnerable and then charge them out uh, for a decent amount of high charge damage and uh, you know lower attack because you only have one axe instead of two. Um, but their range damage profile is not that high either. 2817 is not that good. You do shoot pretty fast. The range is not impressive. Overall, my opinion of Zhang Yan's units are the level 1 version is great. I don't think I want to wait till level 5 to get these guys. They're not going to change the game for me that much. If I'm going to focus on ambush playstyle, I'll just spam these guys. These guys just function much better than both of these units. Alright, moving on to our second band of action, Zheng Jiang. So Zheng Jiang's unit it plays with hidden axes, and hidden axes are good because they have stock, it means they remain hidden, and they also have snipe. They also have a bow on their back that they can use. So the whole idea of these units is they can steal, you know, settlements for you by sneaking into them because they are stocked, so no one can see them until they're up close. You can give them poison arrows, so they have snipe and stock. They can do the same thing as most poison archers can do. They have a pretty good damage profile on their. Uh, archer damage, um, you know, it's decent for a dual use unit that features mainly axe. You know, the archer is their secondary, and they have the same damage profile here as you have with the Black Mountain Marauder. So they're kind of a combination of a poison archer unit and a Black Mountain Marauder, which makes them actually quite good. So hidden axes are very useful. And the upgraded version here, the Fist of the Bandit Queen, uh, the difference here is really just extra stats. Uh, you're carrying the same weapon profile as the hidden axes, except for you see you have more morale, you have more charge, uh, you have slightly higher armor, and you have slightly higher melee evasion. And aside from that, nothing really changes here. Finally, we have Yan Bai Hu, who is also a free LC. Um, so Yan Bai Hu here comes with White Tiger Warriors starting at rank 1. Now these guys look very different. Look at it. I don't know why you need to wear so much in the south, it's not very cold. But you also have this makeshift giant axe, which gives them splash attack. That's the difference here. Pretty interesting weapon profile here. I think the damage is very similar to what you see in the camp crushers. Right, slow swinging, but uh, higher damage. Here we have very, very high armor piercing damage, which makes them very interesting. They have no protection whatsoever. No range protection, very low armor. Uh, very low evasion, but they do have stock. Uh, so that's because of Yan Bai Hu mainly. So you're also trying to play either an ambush style or you're just sneaking across the open field to kill things because your generals, a lot of bandits, have stock available. So you can close gap without worrying about enemy range picking you off, and then you're just basically doing heavy damage to infantry piles uh, with your axe. Uh, but you're not, you're a level one unit, so just be mindful. You know you have low armor, you're gonna take a lot of damage as you deal a lot of damage. Now, the White Tiger Raiders are one of my, you know, more, I guess, favorite units when the bandits first got revamped because you have Snipe and Stock and you have Poison Arrow automatically on these guys. So what you want to do with White Tiger Raiders, which are available after rank 3, so rank 1 and rank 3 for the bandit units here for these two, uh, what you want to do is you want to use a similar approach to the Yellow White Hunter we mentioned earlier for Yellow Turbans. You just want to shoot one volley of poison on all the units, get them to bleed out, and that's about it. All right? You have range block chance, which is shocking because you have this um, shield on the back because you can switch them uh, into melee mode even though it doesn't animate as such. Uh, we don't have a strategist to be able to use shield wall, but they can and they have a makeshift shield and a one-handed spear to use. Um, so that's kind of, they're flexible, right? You can use them as an anti-range frontline unit with very good range block chance. You can also use them as archer unit that stays hidden to shoot poison arrows. So very useful unit here for Yan Bai Hu's faction. And with that, we looked at all the units. So let's finish up our tier list by ranking these and we'll jump right back to that. See you guys there. Alrighty, so to wrap up our tier list here, let's rank all these units. So first up is Camp Crushers from Lu Bu's faction. So Camp Crushers are these heavy armored, splash damage, slow hitting units that has good charge. So what you want to do with these is kind of like cavalry. You want to charge in, get a couple whacks, pull out, 
preferably route the enemy and then just find another unit to charge at. I don't think they're game changer because they are weak against enemy archers, but I would still put them as an A unit because they can protect themselves from cavalry, so that's a plus. But I think they're kind of similar to Chen Royal Guards and they're kind of versatile and they have a special purpose and they hit hard. Um, flying Riders, these guys are definitely the C tier. You would never see them in a campaign because you would just be recruiting sea down cavalry. So they're kind of falling the same category here. You gotta wait till rank six. They do worse than sea down cavalry, so you would just never recruit them. And Maiden Guard. So they have a special purpose in your army. I think you wouldn't spam these, but you would use them. You will recruit at least one to give your uh, you know general some defense. They can tank up against range unit, and they can do decently well chasing enemy archers away. So I think that's their purpose. Tiger's Guard, I think, think is probably B tier, maybe even C tier. No, probably B, low B. The reason being you gotta wait till rank six, so that's a big um, threshold that you have to wait for. And you probably already have armies of spear guards and you'll be using front lines of a lot of mercenary infantry. So I don't see a purpose for these. And if you've already recruited handmade guard, you don't actually need these because they don't stack. So maybe you want one for offensive general, one for defensive general on the front line, but you will probably only recruit one of these at most. So I don't feel like they have a role in your campaign. So I think they're B tier here. All right, moving on to the bandits. We have uh, Zhang Yan's faction first with the Black Mountain Marauders. These are your shock dual axe units. I think given that you're playing as Zhang Yan, you want to be heavily ambush based. These units are actually probably S tier for you. They're not strong, right? If you, hmm, actually, are they A? No, I think it's same as Fury Bay High. Like on paper, they're not dominating, but like you would spam them in your campaign. They do everything you want to do. Caught scare, have guerrilla deployment, be able to charge out of ambushes, uh, kill off, um, Axe uh, shield a unit because they have axe. Hmm. Yeah, I think we'll stick them as S. Uh, these guys will be D because they do everything, you know, worse than the axe marauders and they have no range protection. You don't need the anti cav because you'll be fighting ambush battles. So I don't see a purpose for them. And even if you're fighting open field fight, you wouldn't put these on your front line right because the range would just shred them so they're definitely just trashed here all right these combination black mountain hunters with a bow and an axe i think they're a you gotta wait till rank five and sure they're versatile actually i don't know they're b they're high b low a because you'd be spamming these guys they do about the same thing like in open field you have the flexibility of the bow but you're not stocked or sniped so you'd be exposed when you shoot. There's a different experience. So I don't think they're that good. They're probably you know considerable to recruit, but you wouldn't want to use them that much. You'd still be relying heavily on these. So I think B tier are just you know usable unit, but you don't you see you know too much of an effort for them, mainly because of the high rank limitation. If you have these available rank one, I would put them as A, maybe even S. All right, moving on to Zhengjiang. Hidden Axes and uh, Fist of the Bandit Queen. These are very similar units. Um, and I think we're going to give them both S tier. That's because there's not many good bandit units after the overhaul. So the fact that you have this stock unit and snipe and you have axe. So they function very similar to Marauders, but you also have snipe on top of that. So you can actually sneak settlements and sneak gates and be able to close range. Uh, to protect yourself from enemy range damage just by walking an open field it makes them very different from these unit right here so i think they're s tier and finally to yan bai hu's faction so these guys i feel is a b tier unit mainly because they're usable because they have good splash damage they're similar to camp crushers in my opinion but they're not as good because they have no armor you have to use them situationally because they're going to be exposed to range and enemy charging cavalry. These guys have charge negate. They do not. Um, so I think they're just an axe alternate version of 
uh, camp crushers, but slightly worse, but still usable because they are available rank one and there's no recruitment limit. And there's not that many good bandit unit. So this is definitely a good unit in the early game. But this is probably the god tier unit for bandits uh, in Yan Bai Hu's faction because you have poison arrow on top of snock and snipe. So they function very similar to Yao Guai hunters. Um, and you can spam these guys, hide them on the field, and just lay waste to enemy armies uh, without them even knowing you're on the map. So I think that's what makes them S tier. Um, and obviously, they're not all equivalent here. You know, the bandit S tier is because the bandit has a restricted amount of units. Uh, and the yellow turban A tier, similarly, yellow turban has a restricted amount of units. It's also strange that none of the old yellow turban units made it to S tier. And I think that might have to do with my inexperience playing yellow turban. Also, the yellow turban has a very good shared pool of units that you don't really need faction unique units to make the yellow turban strong. There's a lot of good units in the yellow turban roster that are not faction unique units. So I think that's why they don't have the S tier status here. But anyways, this is our tier list. And uh, I know it's not everyone's going to agree with this. And even I'm probably going to change my mind from time to time. So hope you guys enjoyed it anyways. And uh, we'll see you guys next time with a different tier list, hopefully of regular units. Uh, and we'll talk about army composition a little bit more as that's highly requested. I so hope you guys enjoyed it and see you guys next time. Bye.